thank you for coming. I always enjoy uh, coming here and teaching here, and I enjoy the preparation of what I'm going to teach. Uh, I think this is the sixth or seventh time that I've taught here, and the first time wasn't recorded, all the rest were. And every time uh, we have talked about eschatology, which is the, uh, the study of uh, end time prophecies. Uh, last time I was here, I think was late December, and uh, that's before I went to Kauai for four months. I taught last semester uh, the book of Genesis. And interesting enough, the book of Genesis, uh, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, if you go to his website at Ariel, A-R-I-E-L, Ministries, you'll find all his, uh, his manuscripts, books, and he's a Messianic Jew, and so I follow his commentary. I, I don't uh, come up with uh, things on my own. Uh, I, I rely on uh, Dr. Fruchtenbaum and other theologians that they have dedicated their entire life to this study. And tonight, uh, well, I'm going back in August, I've been uh, assigned the book of Revelation to teach at the Kauai Bible College, so I'll be teaching that. And I'll be uh, following uh, Dr. John Walward. He has a book called uh, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. And you can get that book, but I'll also be looking at the commentary from Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum's book, The Footsteps of the Messiah. Last time we spoke on Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5, which was the, the throne in heaven, what John saw, and we also talked about Revelation chapter 5, which was the lamb and the scroll. And so, you know, over time, God has revealed to the prophets and what John saw in the book of Revelation, Matthew writes a little bit about the Olivet Discourse, what's going to happen? And ever since... Uh, I read the book, uh, The Late Great Planet Earth, by uh, Hal Lindsey, saw the movie. I have been interested in what's going to happen in the end times. I love, I love the Old Testament uh, scriptures. I, I like what the prophets reveal. I, I enjoyed Genesis more than ever, the way I taught. It was so deep. When you know and learn about some of the, the Hebrew words, what those meanings are, and how did this apply to five or 6,000 years ago, rather than westward, the Western world thinking based on English uh, of, of where we are today? And you try to go back to what, did, what was the author really saying to the people back then? And so that's what's interesting because that's when they were writing to, the, to those audiences and, and not try to twist it so that we understand it today, but try to understand it. What, was, what did God really mean to teach and tell us. And so next semester uh, when I'm teaching uh, on the book of Revelation, uh, I don't know if there'll be much opportunity to add much from the whole envelope of eschatology. There might be some opportunities to find some things, but I only have 14 weeks to cover 22 chapters in the book of Revelation. And I don't want to cut the students short by jumping into a lot of what the prophets say. Because I've done that in the past, and three-hour lessons every Sunday t took me three and a half years. And so I, d I don't have that kind of opportunity. But the thing is, what John saw on the line of Patmos is basically the book of Revelation, the apocalypse, the unveiling, the revealing of Jesus Christ. And in chapter 1 of Revelation, in verse 19, is the outline for everything of the book of Revelation. And in chapter 19, basically it says, write what you see. And what John saw was the resurrected Messiah in his glory. That's basically in chapter 1. And then it says, write the things that are. And the things that were at that time was the church age. Remember, Jesus, in the, in, in the year of A.D. 30, in the year A.D. 30, in A.D. 30, Jesus was crucified. 
He went down into Hades for three days to preach to the captives. And then he resurrected from the dead and he ascended to the third heaven in A.D. 30. Well, in A.D. 95, John writes, John writes what he saw on the island of Patmos. And this is what was going through my mind. Jesus ascends to the Father. He ascends to the Father. Sits at the right hand. He's there 65 years. And the Father says, go back to earth. 65 years. I mean, that's like my whole lifetime. So you got to figure, people, people have been living a long time. Jesus is up here. Go back and reveal. Reveal to John and to the, and to the saints, the Christians, what's going to happen. Reveal who you are and write. Write to the seven churches. By this time, the seven churches have been going on for about 65 years. Well, things weren't going the way they were supposed to go. He writes, what are they doing wrong? What are they doing that's right? What do they need to do to change? What do they need to overcome? In Revelation chapters 2 and 3, are these seven letters. And so you have to ask yourselves, okay, what do I need to overcome? Because in Revelation 21, verse 7, he writes in verse 7, to those who overcome will inherit all these things. All of what things? The things that are listed in the first six verses of chapter 21. That's what you're going to inherit. Basically, the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, tabernacling, dwelling with the Father and Jesus. That's what you're going to inherit for those who overcome. Okay? If you don't overcome, what's going to happen? Well, that's when you go to verse 8, which is the lake of fire. So, to me, I was thinking, if Jesus has to come back to the earth, if the Father has to tell the Messiah, go back and reveal. Because remember on the cross, before Jesus died, he said, to Talestai, it is finished. I have completed my work. Now he can go to the Father. But he has to come back and tell us more. And these are to the seven churches, which makes up uh, the churches even to this day. Now, we are in the seventh church era, the church of Laodicea. So there's seven churches laid out chronologically, and we're in the last one before the tribulation. And during this last era is, of course, the rapture. We don't know when that's going to happen. Scripture doesn't say it isn't going to happen. But it does give you a hint. It says when the full number of the Gentiles come in. So there's a number. When the full number of the Gentiles come in, then basically there's going to be a rapture. And so we know that. We also know that whenever the rapture happens, sometime later, the tribulation is, is going to start. The tribulation does not start with the rapture. There are some events that have to happen. We covered that one time. There's some events that, uh, that when you study eschatology that have to happen. Some of the events already happened. We talked about that uh, when we talked about the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. Okay, so that talks about the events. Some of the events already happened, like Israel becoming a nation, like Israel taking control of, uh, of Jerusalem, okay? And uh, so we talked about that before. And then if you go to, uh, to the website that uh, Mike has set up, 
you can go back to these teachings and go back and review them. Now, some of you that have been to all my teachings, by now you should probably almost have a binder fixed with all the handouts that I've had. And this is one piece. Now, what I want to talk about today is before the messianic kingdom or the millennium or the thousand year reign, Daniel talks about 75 days of what's going to happen that, that, that John doesn't see. But Daniel talks about it. And so we'll find that for those of you that have your Bibles, we find that in the book of Daniel. And if you don't have your Bibles, on that first page of the handouts, you will see it right there about um, the fourth paragraph. And it says, And from the time that the continual burnt offering shall be taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he that waits and comes to the 1,335 days. Okay, now, how long is the tribulation? Seven years. So we have a seven year tribulation. At what point does the abomination of desolation happen? At three and a half years or mid trib. Okay. What is the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet? Okay, the Antichrist, that's part of it. The Antichrist sits on the... Okay, is there a temple in Jerusalem right now? No. Not yet. Okay, so first of all, there has to be a new temple, right? There has to be a new temple built sometime, sometime before mid-trib, there has to be a new Jewish temple. The third one, known as the Tribulation Temple. Because otherwise the Antichrist can't come in at mid-trib and sit on the Holy of Holies and uh, declare himself to be God, okay? Now, if you, uh, and you will see here on the handouts that I gave you, um, in Revelation chapter 13, you're going to find out that the first beast... The, the beast out of the sea is the Antichrist. And then you're going to find out that the, the beast out of the earth is the false prophet. So the, the false prophet, the false prophet is going to have power. So is the Antichrist, the first beast. And he's going to set up an image in the holies of holies. And that image is going to have it's going to be the image of the Antichrist, and it's going to have the power to speak. Okay? And um, I'm trying to find uh, my notes here. And it's also going to breathe. That's the image. Okay? It's going to have powers. And that image is going to have power. That's going to deceive the world. That's going to deceive what you call the earth dwellers. So you have, you have the saints, and then you have earth dwellers, those that don't believe in any of this. They're, they're just dwelling on the earth until the time is the end. And so this image is going to have the power to deceive the earth dwellers to take the mark of the beast, right? In other words, if you want to buy food, water, fuel for heat, if you, uh, clothing, there's no way to be able to go out in the market without the mark of the beast. But once you take the mark of the beast, there is no opportunity for salvation. And so that's the abomination of desolation. And so what we just read here, from the time that the, the burnt offering shall be taken away. Well, that tells you there, there's no temple right now. So that means you haven't had, you haven't had a temple and an altar 
to sacrifice animals since when? 70. 70 AD. Since 70 AD, that's when the temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? I'm sorry. He destroyed the first temple. Uh, the Romans destroyed uh, the second temple in 70 AD. So now you, you would sacrifice an animal, a lamb or a ram, without a blemish that's pure. And that blood would be sprinkled on the people to cover your sins. So basically, for those that believe in what the Messiah did, his blood was the final sacrifice. Correct? Mm -hmm. And so those that believe, basically, it's his blood where your sins are washed away. The animal blood basically covered your sins, but it's his blood that was washed away. So there's been no temple for about 2,000 years. The Antichrist is going to allow them to build their temple on the Temple Mount. It has to be based in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 40-48, uh, through 48, it starts talking about everything that's happened during the Messianic Kingdom, during this era here. So if you read uh, Ezekiel chapter 40-48, to uh, 48, uh, you'll get that. So, uh, so it says here, from the time that the continual burnt offering shall be taken away. That means, that means there's, offerings go, there's offerings going on somewhere here in, in the first half. There, there, there's some sacrifices going on by the Jews. But that's going to be taken away. Because you remember the Antichrist, the Antichrist is going to make a seven-year covenant, right? With the Jews. Once that covenant is signed by the Antichrist and the Jewish religious leaders, the, uh, the, the tribulation begins. That's when the tribulation begins. Not with the rapture, but when that covenant happens. Three and a half years to the abomination of desolation, three and a half years to the second coming. The second coming of Christ. And you can read about the second coming of Christ in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. When he's a rider on the white horse. Now, Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, that's the first time we see a rider on the white horse, but that's the Antichrist. That's way back in Revelation 2. 19 is, is, the, is, the, uh, is, is, is the Messiah coming in a white horse. Now, everybody that has died that doesn't believe have been down here in Hades, correct? At that time, you had an unrighteous chamber and you had a righteous chamber. But Jesus emptied the righteous chamber, basically Abraham's bosom, right? Abraham's bosom. Jesus called it paradise. He went down to the center of the earth to free the captives. And they came up to the third heaven. So you have paradise up here now. And that was the righteous. The unrighteous are still here. They're still waiting. The unrighteous. So you got the messianic, I mean you have the tribulation but something has to happen before the messianic kingdom can happen. First of all, the saints, the overcomers, the overcoming saints, they're coming up here to the Bema Seat of Christ. And why are they going to the Bema Seat? What happens at the Bema Seat of Christ? Bema seat means judgment. The judgment of Christ. Why are the saints coming to the uh, judgment seat or the Bema seat of Christ? Rewards and crowns. What happens after that? The marriage ceremony. The marriage ceremony. Not the marriage feast. 
The marriage feast happens over here. Who goes to the marriage ceremony? Who goes to any marriage? Who's the, who, the marriage is between who? The bride and the groom. Uh, who's, who's the groom? Jesus. Je Jesus Christ. Who's the bride? The church. The overcomers. See, there's two ways to get there. Overcome through the rapture or come through the tribulation. Those that come to Christ during the tribulation, where do they go when they're killed? Under the altar. So, so they go under the altar. And they say, when are you going to avenge our blood? And what does Jesus tell them? Wait until the number. There's another number that has to be satisfied over here. And so you have the saints here that have been beheaded. You know, and then, and then over here you have other saints that didn't take the mark. But there are some people, there are some people that are going to make it all the way through the tribulation and come over here. So when Jesus comes back in the second coming, he comes with the armies of heaven dressed in white linen which is the bride. He's coming back here. You see, by the time the second coming happened, the wedding ceremony is over. Everybody that didn't make this, but you're a believer, you're basically going to be a friend. And when you go to a wedding, who's all, who's all in the church? Yeah. Friends and relatives, right? Mm -hmm. But who, who, who's up at the altar? Yeah. The bride and the groom. So, you can either decide to be an overcomer and be a bride, or you can end up being a friend, like the Old Testament saints. So, in this handout, you're going to find out some events that have to happen from the end of the tribulation before the messianic kingdom happens. And Daniel is the only one that talks about that in, in Daniel chapter 12 through 11. Now, if you look in chapter 12 of Daniel, and, and you look in verse 4, at this time, God, or, or Michael the archangel, not Michael, Gabriel, has been revealing to uh, Daniel end-time prophecies, as well as to Nebuchadnezzar. But in, in verse 4, Daniel writes, But as for you, Daniel, Gabriel's talking to him, Conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Okay? And then uh, down in, uh, in verse 7, partway down it says, uh, I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river as he raised his right hand and his left towards heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be times, times and half a time that these events were going to happen. So what he is saying that it's going to be time, in the Hebrew time, this is going to be one year. Times, that's plural, so that's going to be two years. And half a time, that equals a half a year. So there you have three and a half years that these events are going to happen. Well, three and a half years is how many months? 42, 42 months. So you've got 42 months, and you're going to find that figure also in a lot of the prophecies. Or in the Jewish culture of that time, a month was 30 days. So the 42 months is how many days? 1260 days, both before the abomination of desolation and afterwards. So we know from the abomination of desolation to the second coming is 
1,260 days. So the Messiah is going to return the second coming 1,260 days after the abomination of desolation. Well, let's go back and read Daniel 12, 11. And from the time that the continual burnt offering shall be taken away, mid-trib, and the abomination that, that makes desolate is set up. When they set up this image at mid-trib, it says there shall be 1,290 days. You see that? So that's 30 days longer. That's 30 days longer. So at this point, you go, you're at your 1290 days, so you're an extra 30 days. For some reason, this image, this abomination of desolation, after the Messiah returns, it stays in the Holy of Holies for an extra 30 days. It doesn't say why it's not destroyed exactly at the second coming. Now, I know that before the second coming, you have the Battle of Armageddon, right? Mm -hmm. So I know that is being set up here when they're going after the Jewish believers in Basra, which is the mountains of Sire. Many people believe that that could be Petra, which is in Jordan. So when the Antichrist moves his headquarters from Babylon to Jerusalem, and to, be, to basically say, I'm God in the Holy of Holies, and the, the Jews say, wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, we're grateful that you let us build a temple and start our animal sacrifices, but we know you're not God. And so they take off. Remember, don't go down in your house to get your clothing, nothing. You know, get moving out to the wilderness. Get, get out of here. Okay? And so they end up somewhere in southern Jordan. Could be Petra, but according to... Uh, Isaiah chapter 63, he calls it Basra. So if, if you read Isaiah 63, you're going to talk about when the Messiah comes back where his garments are all full of blood, where he's been slaying the nations. Okay, and so in Isaiah 63, you'll read that. And he slays them from the southern Jordan all the way back to the Mount of Olives. So when the Messiah comes back the second time, it's to, to, to save the Jews that the believing Jews, and he's killing all, everybody, including the horses, all the way back to the Mount of Olives, okay? And so maybe that's going on with part of these 30 days. And he goes to save the Jews, so maybe it takes him 30 days to get back to Jerusalem before he can take care of the business. Not sure. But it's 30 days before that image is removed. And then if you keep reading, it says, Blessed is he that waits... In Daniel uh, eleven twelve, 12. Blessed is he that waits and comes to the 1,305 and 30 days. So now, there's 1,335 days here. But if you can get to that point, you're blessed. You are blessed if you can get to that point. Now, in Matthew chapter 25... In Matthew 25, you're going to read, there's another judgment. And this is the judgment of the Gentiles. Also known as the judgment of the sheep and goats. You read that, right? The sheep on my right hand, the goats on my left hand. And he talks about, you know, if, if you've given water to my, to my brethren, the brethren, the Jews... You're giving them water, you're giving them food, you're giving them clothing, you're visiting in prison. Because in the second half of the tribulation, the Jews are running for their lives. 42 months, 1,260 days. If you happen to be in this arena, if you happen not to make the rapture, and a lot of Christians aren't going to make the rapture. I'm not going to lie to you. I hope we all do, but I'm not sure if that's going to happen. And there's other things I can tell you, but I'm not going to teach that tonight. But if you don't make it, and you have to try to survive seven years. Now, the first three and a half years, if you're Jews, the Antichrist is going to leave you alone. He's going other places, okay? But there's a lot of cosmic, there's a lot of other judgments that are going to be happening. Uh, in, the, in the first, um, the, the, the uh, seal judgments, the trumpet judgments in the first half, 
You've got to survive all that. In the second uh, half, you're going to have to deal with the, the bold judgments. Okay? And so that's going on. Now, in the second half, the minute you don't, you don't worship the Antichrist as God, they're taken off. They're not taking anything with them. Because Jesus says, when you see this happen, when you see the abomination of desolation happen, this image has power. It can breathe, it can speak, it can deceive. And he's going to have all kinds of power. And they're, they're moving, but God's going to protect them. God's going to protect them for three and a half years. It says he's going to protect them for 42 months in Revelation 11 too. Uh, he's going he's to, and in Revelation chapter 13, it talks about, uh, about the Antichrist uh, having powers in the image. And so for three and a half years, what you have to eat you have to drink. If it's cold, you need clothing. If you need fuel, you know, how, how are you, you going to get that? So first of all, uh, if you happen to be caught in this era, I hope you're not, but if you do, get rid of your cell phone, get rid of your iPad, get rid of your laptop, get rid of your vehicle. They all have GPS. You've got to figure some way to get around with something that can't be tracked. And in those days, you know, we've got a lot of satellites also going overhead that can track you. And you have to figure out, how, how, how do I survive? Can I go underground? You probably can. How are you going to eat and drink and clothe? Oh, well, that's going to be the situation for the, for the Jews that believe that don't take the mark. And everybody that doesn't take, you don't want to take the mark. You take the mark, then it doesn't matter. You can have all the food and drink you want, but, but, but now you're giving your allegiance to the Antichrist. Now, there's no chance of salvation once you have that mark. So you're not going to want the mark, but yet at the same time, you have to figure out how to survive. And at the same time, you better be helping the Jews. If you help the Jews, you're going to be considered a sheep. And he's going to say, enter in you know, to, to the kingdom that the Lord has prepared for you. If you're a goat and you just took care of yourself and your family, but you didn't help the Jews, you're a goat. And he, and he says, you're cursed away from me. And so you went through all this for nothing. You end up in the lake of fire. And so there's 75 days that Daniel talks about of what has to happen. And if you look at your chart, okay, first of all, and, and this is not in order, okay? So and you're, in the chart, you're going to see there's, uh, what is it, eight things that have to happen. But, but there's nowhere in the scriptures that tells you the order. But, so one thing we know is that this abomination of desolation, this image has to be removed, okay? We know that the bride has already been resurrected. We know the overcomers have been resurrected, okay? We also know way back here when the Messiah went to heaven, he took the Old Testament saints, right? He took the believers. They went up to the third heaven, okay? So we know the Old Testament saints are, are up there. Everybody that died in Noah's flood, okay? The unrighteous, they're here. So they've been waiting for thousands of years. And everybody that has died since then who did not believe in, in, in God are, are down here in Hades waiting for the second resurrection, which is not going to happen until the second resurrection happens over here at, uh, after the thousand years at the great white throne judgment. Only to have the books open and to end up in the lake of fire. So this is not a good place to be at any time today in Hades. If you die today, you go straight to the third heaven. But before, before the Messiah, you would go to Abraham's bosom or, or paradise. But now paradise is up there. So uh, you're going to remove the image. And, uh, and then all of a sudden... The, the Old Testament saints, they, they have to be, the Old Testament saints have to, in other words, it's your spirit. When you die, it's your spirit that goes to heaven, right? And your body goes into the grave, or it goes into the ocean, or it's burnt, or, or someone 
uh, cremate you and, and, and spread your ashes all over. And see, the Jews didn't do that because they believed in the resurrection, that your body and your spirit are going to come back together. And see, the pagans used to, to uh, uh, they didn't believe in the resurrection, so they basically cremated their bodies. So anyway, uh, so your bodies and your spirit comes back together at the rapture for the New Testament saints, and then during this 75-day period, it happens for the Old Testament saints, and those under the altar. These are the tribulation saints. And I'm going to move this, because I'm, I'm not sure if some of you can see that. I can come over here for my notes. So you, got, you, have, you have tribulation saints. You have Old Testament saints. They need to come before the Messianic Kingdom, because they're going to live during this thousand-year reign also. And that's another teaching of what we're going to be doing during the thousand-year reign. So there's, there's a wedding feast, a, a, a marriage feast, a wedding feast, that's, that the feast is going to happen. The ceremony has already happened. But there's a feast, and that's where all the friends come. That's where all the friends come, the Old Testament saints, the tribulation saints, okay? So they all have to, they all have to their spirits and their, and their bodies have to unite. So now you have the Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints, the tribulation saints spirit and body all together at the wedding feast because the ceremony already happened. So, that, so you have, that's going to happen during this 75-day 75-day uh, period. Also during this 75-day period, Satan has to be bound, right? Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years in the abyss. So you, you can see in the chart, so Satan's going to be down here in this, uh, for the thousand years, he's going to be in the abyss. So that he doesn't deceive the nations anymore during the thousand years. But after the thousand years, he's going to be released for a time, right? He's going to be released for a time. Well, what's the purpose with that? Everybody born during the thousand year kingdom will not have Satan to have deceived them. So He's going to be released and given an opportunity to deceive those. If you live in the Messianic kingdom, if you believe, you don't die. You live for the thousand years. Okay? So Satan's released. And if you read the scriptures, it says that the number of people that Satan deceives at the end, it's like, it's like the number of sand in the seas, the beaches. That's mind-boggling. You have Messiah, you have Jesus on the throne, ruling with an iron rod, and yet Satan's going to be able to deceive that many people uh, before the great white throne judgment. If you don't believe during the messianic kingdom, there is no salvation. You're not going to have like uh, Old Testament saints uh, New or the tribulation saints. If, if you don't believe, you're given 100 years, if you don't believe during the Messianic Kingdom, then you, you've already uh, sealed your destiny at that point. See, we're all eternal beings, right? We, we will all live eternally. We just don't know what address we're going to live at. So you've got an opportunity to choose. You get to choose where you want to live. And you get to choose when you're going to go. And if, if you read in Acts chapter 10 about Cornelius... In Acts chapter 10, it talks about Cornelius being an overcomer. About uh, that, uh, you know, Cornelius was a centurion from the, uh, the Italian re regiment, okay? But him and his whole household believed. They were God-fearing, yeah. all right? They were God-fearing. So when you say a whole household, not just his children, but probably all his slaves and everybody else believed. He gave alms to the Jewish people, okay? So he, he, he was all about doing uh, the Lord's work as far as making other people believe, giving alms. Uh, and so he had to learn about the scriptures because if you're God-fearing, that means you're, you're, you're obeying the law, right? You're not living the way you want. And so Cornelius is a great example on how to be an overcomer, Acts chapter 10. And I would look at that. And so, uh, so here we are. We've got the Old Testament saints have come together uh, spirit and body, the tribulation saints, 
Uh, Satan is uh, bound for a thousand years. Uh, the sheep and goat judgment, Matthew chapter 25, that's going to happen. And you can read that in chapter 25 about the sheep and goats. I'm not going to cover that. Uh, so, if you get to the 1,335 years, basically that means you were a sheep. There's no way to get there. Because it says blessed. So, that means you were a sheep. Which means not only did you make it through here, but basically you helped the Jews survive. Okay. So that better be your mission. If you really believe who Jesus is, then you better be about kingdom work. You better be serving. You better be helping the Jews. A lot of us just do our own thing and say, well, I think I'm going anyway because I believe in Jesus. Well, then you have to look at the scriptures, you know. For instance, uh, Jesus talked about some parables in chapter 25, right? And the good one he talks about is, is the ten virgins, right? The ten virgins. And, and he talks about when, the, when, the, when the, uh, the sound came for the groom, right? Five were ready, right? They had their oil. They trimmed their lamps. The other five weren't watching and they weren't ready. And they're asking the five that were ready and had their oil, give us some. They said, no, we can't because we might not have enough. Go into town and buy some. When, when they came, the groom came, the five virgins that were watching and they were ready, they go in with the groom and the door's closed. The door's closed. The door's sealed. They come back and knock, let us in. And he says, no, you know, away from me. And he says, the others went into the wedding. They went to the wedding. Now, the five that didn't go, well, they're still virgins, right? They're still virgins, mm -hmm. all right? But they weren't watching and they weren't ready. So they didn't go into the wedding. And you read the parables and you read about the servants, right? The servants that got the talents. Well, then there was one servant that didn't use his talent, right? He buried it. And Jesus called him, you wicked servant, right? Cast out in utter darkness. But he's still a servant. Just like the other two were servants. He just wasn't doing the Lord's work. The outer darkness is here. At one time they thought that, that the outer darkness meant hell. It doesn't say that. See, back in those days, back in those days, in the Roman days, if you were a, a, a wicked servant, you were, you were cast into a dungeon where it was utterly dark, cold and damp. But you're still a servant. And that's where you're at. And you, and you waited. And so this is the parables that Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 25, when he starts talking about the kingdom. The kingdom is, is like a king who, who prepared a feast for his son. But all those invited didn't come. And the king was angry. So then he says, go out into the streets and invite everybody to come in. Everybody to come in. But one gets in without a wedding garment, right? In those days, the king would basically make a wedding garment for all those that were invited. So you didn't have to say, well, the guy was poor, he couldn't afford a wedding garment. No. The king prepared the wedding garment for all the guests. So when the king comes along, he says, how, how did you get in? Where's your wedding garment? You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so, so in the word of God, I'm so grateful for his word because he, he, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't trick us, right? He's not trying to deceive us. He's telling us everything that we need to do to believe in him, to follow him. There's a lot of people that know of Jesus, right? But if you really believe him, if you really love him, what did Jesus say? If you love me, you obey my commandments. I mean, was he kidding? Well, no, he wasn't. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. If you love someone, you're going to want to do everything you can to do what they say. Right? If you love them. So, if you follow him, you've got to give up your life, right? If you love your life, and a lot of us do, we, just, we love our life tremendously. But we still go to church. We still tithe. We go to Bible studies. So, we love our life. We're using all our time and our money to build our mansions, 
here on earth, right? But oh, but I, I want to be at the, I want to be at the wedding ceremony. See, we're divided, and and, and you you can't be. See, there, there's everything with the Lord is black and white. There, there, there's no gray area. And if all of a sudden we find out, you know, all of a sudden you find out that the raptures happen and you show up to church and you find out, wow, church is full. Did any of us go? Huh? Well, that's not a good situation. I mean, how many were saved in the flood? <laughs> there were billions some people because you lived 900 years. And it's all because of one man, Noah. And because of him, God saved his family. And, uh, so and Sodom and Gomorrah, how many were saved? Huh? Three. Three. But how big was Lot's family? Four. Or more. Oh, yeah, and daughters, right? Daughters and daughter-in-laws. Yeah. Right? Well, if you've got a daughter-in-law, then, uh, I mean, it talks about, I'm sorry, daughters and son-in-laws. Son yeah. Right? It talks about that, right? Yeah. Daughters and son-in-laws. So if you have son-in-laws, plural, that means you have at least two son-in-laws. That means you have at least two other daughters. Unless there's three. So wh why did Abraham stop at, Lord, if, if, if you only find ten? Why did he stop there? Well, I'm going to speculate that he knew that Lot's family was ten. Right? But, but only, only him and, and two daughters make it. Okay? And so... Uh, so when we think that, well, you know, everybody, you know, just, just be good. And, uh, and I'll see you at the wedding ceremony. And I'm thinking, well, if we're wrong, what happened? Do you think you're going to really start studying these scriptures? No. Now, what happened here? I thought for sure I was going to be raptured. Being over. I mean, everybody's told me, even from the pulpit. You know, you give your life to Christ, but wait a minute, was I, was I, was I a Cornelius? Was I a Cornelius? Was I God-fearing? Was I obeying all the commandments? Was I giving alms and tithes to the church, to the Jews? Was I doing that? Was I out making disciples? Was I mentoring anybody? Was I, or, or, or was I too busy with my own life? trying to put bread on my table and raise my kids and hey, everybody else is on their own. But I'll, I'll still come to church here. But if all the numbers beforehand have always been small numbers, why, why would that rapture be any different? Why would those coming to the tribulation be any different? There's going to be a lot of people under the altar, right, when you read that? From every tribe, nation, and tongue. See, there's going to be a lot of people that, that are going to miss the rapture. That they're going to really become strong believers, right? Mm -hmm. you, you want to behead me? All right, that's what it takes. That's what it takes. Because if I missed it here, I'm definitely not going to miss it here. But some, some probably still will. But, I mean, this is not the way I want to, this is not the way I want to get to the third heaven. That's not the way I want to get there. And I don't think that's any way anybody wants to get there. But some are going to get there this way. Others can become overcomers. So now, here we are, it's 75 days, and then the Messianic Kingdom starts. So, even if you make it through, there's another judgment. You've got, you got the judgment seat of Christ, the bema seat of Christ. This is for crowns and rewards. This has nothing to do with salvation. When these books are open, this is to determine the rewards and the crowns that you get. The judgment of the sheep and goats, that happens to determine, did you help the Jews? Were you pro-Semitic or were you anti-Semitic? That's the criteria to get into the Messianic Kingdom. Okay? You don't want to be at the great white throne judgment. Those books that are open is to determine the degree of penalty that you will suffer in the lake of fire. There's no time limit here. After a million years go by, the Lord's going to say, you know what, I think they've been there long enough. I think they've learned a lesson. What about a billion years? 
No, there's no time. This is, this is for eternity. You didn't want to accept the Lord, you didn't want to do what he said, then, then this is where you're going to be for eternity. And so now you're seeing the picture that's happening here. Is, is we're somewhere be, before this mark here, 2017. I don't know how close we are to this rapture. Uh, but we know we better be serving, right? And we all want to say, well done, good and faithful servant. But, well, if he's calling me a servant, I mean, if he's going to call me a servant, that means I've got to be serving, right? I've got to be serving in the church. I've got to be doing something for the kingdom. Now, well done. Okay. Uh, good and faithful servant. Everybody wants to hear those words. But they say, well, I've never served. Well, there's no way he can call you uh, a servant. You see what I'm saying? And so every, everything, that, you know, it's amazing that the, the time that God took to have his word given to the prophets and the other scribes. You see, uh, this is how he thinks. This is how he thinks. If you want to think like God, then basically you have to have all this in here. If this is not in here, you can't speak like he does. If you can't think and speak like he does, you definitely can't act and walk like he does. Because we're watching TV, we're watching the radio, we're listening to our neighbors and our friends, right? And we're getting all of their philosophy. And so we're making our decisions based on all of that. So what comes through our eyes and our ear gates is coming from the world. And you say, well, Jesus says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, re renew your minds. You know, metanoia in Greek. You know, after profound understanding, you start thinking the way he thinks. You know, you can only speak and act the way you think. And so where have you been getting your information your whole life? Where have you been getting it? You just can't sit here and read this just like any, any, any ordinary book. You know, this is the Word of God. And He tells us how we're supposed to think, how we're supposed to uh, talk and act. And he, he wants, once your mind is renewed, then you, then, then you can be transformed, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can be transformed into the image of Christ, right? But we can't be transformed into the image of Christ if, if we don't even know what His Word says. You know, in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, right? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was God, okay? In the beginning, He was with God, and that's the Word. And so, this Word, remember in John in chapter 6, when he starts talking about that, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they say, oh, we can't understand this. See, they're thinking in worldly terms, in second. They're not thinking in spiritual. You know, Jesus is the Word. You have to eat His Word. You eat, you know, we are what we eat, right? And that's what Jesus is saying. You know, eat my flesh, drink my blood. And what did it say? Many of His disciples didn't follow Him anymore. That, that was too hard of an understanding because they were thinking worldly and they weren't thinking spiritually. Okay, let's see. Uh, questions? You see now in Daniel where it talks about the extra 75 days. When he talks to 1,290 days, and then he talks to 1,335 days. That's the 75 days that has to happen before the Messianic Kingdom happens. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, in the 75 days, the abomination of desolation has to be removed, the image. We know that, the, oh, the Antichrist and the false prophet, okay, are cast into the lake of fire. Right here. Now, they are the first inhabitants of the lake of fire. And they're in the lake of fire during the entire messianic kingdom. So they're in the lake of fire 1,000 years before anybody else goes in there. And they're cast in there alive. 
And so, uh, so that's where, and then Satan's uh, bound for a thousand years. And then the judgment of the Gentiles, Matthew chapter 25, the sheep and goat judgment. Uh, they're there during this time. Uh, the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. We talk about that. They're, they're up there in the third heaven waiting. They're not at the beam of seat of Christ because they're, they're not the bride. Only the bride's getting uh, the crowns and the rewards. Uh, the resurrection of the Old Testament saints and the resurrection of the tribulation saints, those that are under the altar. All this has to happen that Daniel talks about there in, in, in Daniel chapter 12, which nobody else has. So the, the first resurrection, the first resurrection is basically, remember Jesus is the first fruits. He was the first fruits of the first resurrection. And then you're going to have the, the overcomers, the church saints. And then in here, you're going to have the, the two witnesses, right? The 144,000 Jews. <clears throat> and then the resurrection of the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints. That completes the first resurrection. It's the resurrection of all the believers. Okay? So the first resurrection in your order, it talks about. That's the first resurrection of all the believers. The second resurrection is the damned. The unbelievers. That the books are open at the great white throne. You don't want to be any part of no second resurrection. Whichever way you, whichever way you decide to, to, to get with the Lord. See, we get, we get to choose, you know. God gave us free will. Kind of like Adam and Eve, right? They, 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 God gave them a free will. Choose. Here's this whole garden. You may eat from any tree in the garden freely. Whatever you want. But there's two trees in the midst of the garden, right? The, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. They're both in the midst of the garden. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Satan says, well, if you eat from that tree, surely you're not going to die. You will be like God. You'll be able to see good and evil. Well, see, that was the age of innocence. They were naked and they weren't ashamed. Age of innocence. But the minute they ate, well, you know the story. The woman gets in a dialogue with a serpent. Right? Yeah. So she ate from that fruit. The minute she eats from that fruit, now she has a knowledge of good and evil. And then Adam eats. He's standing right there. And so now he eyes are opened also. And now the first thing, they, oh my gosh, we're naked. Now we're trying to cover ourselves, right? See, they got, they got to choose. There was only one tree they couldn't eat from. Only one. In the entire garden. So where's Satan at? That one tree. That one tree. Now God spoke to Adam and gave him the, the what not to do. And then he told Eve. And Eve, well, I was deceived by the serpent. You know? And Adam says, well, Adam, where are you? Well, I was afraid. Why were you afraid? Because I was naked. Why are you naked? Who told you? Yeah. You know? Who, who, you know? Who told you you're naked? He says... It's the woman you gave me. Hmm? You gave me her. I didn't ask for her. You gave her to me. So he's indirectly blaming God, right? And it's her. She gave me to eat. Right? So right away, they got corrupt that fast. Oh, it's a woman you gave me. She gave me to eat. Eve, what is this you have done? It's a serpent. Right? The serpent deceived me. Now a lot of people say, well, Adam didn't try to stop her. We don't know that. We don't know that. Because she could have said, well, it's the man. He didn't try to stop me. Well, she doesn't say that. So nothing in Scripture tells us whether or not he tried to stop her. But she knew, she knew what fruit was allowed to eat. She knew what was forbidden. And she knew the penalty. She knew the penalty. On that day we'll surely die. Oh, no, no, you won't surely die. You'll be like God. Just like Satan, right? Lucifer. He wanted to be like God. Right? What did you say? I saw Satan fall like lightning. And so Satan wanted to put doubt in the woman. Put doubt in her. You know, no, no, you'll be like God. No, he didn't really say that. So she wanted to be like God, just the way Lucifer wanted to be like God. And, and, and Adam... Was he deceived? No. He knew what God said. God told him directly. He told the woman. 
So his act was an act of rebellion. He sinned knowing that he was sinning. The woman was deceived, but not Adam. So this condition that we're in, the human condition, is because of Adam. God holds the man responsible, not the woman. But yet they're all cursed, right? And so now, so now we have to go through all this because of Adam and Eve. But God gives us a way out, right? God sends a redeemer to redeem us, to have eternal life with the Father. And that's fantastic. But we get to choose. Like Adam and Eve. We get to choose. Do we want to be with Jesus or no? Do we want to be the Father or no? Do we want to be an overcomer or no? Oh, that's just too hard. That's too hard. I'll, I know people say, you know what? I don't care if I miss the rapture. I'll catch up over here. Can you believe that? I had an uncle. I had an uncle. He told me, I know I'm not going to heaven. I know I'm going to hell. But he said, that's okay, because all my friends are going to be there. And I'm thinking, I don't care if my friends are here. I'm not going to be there with them. You know? And I want to be an overcomer. I want to be a believer, God-fearing. I want to be a servant. I want to give tithings and alms. And I want to be making disciples. And so, I teach in Kauai. I live in New Mexico, but I live, I live in Kauai. I taught Genesis the last four months before I came here. I, I think I've been gone five weeks, and I came to see my son. Then I go down to Atlanta to see my daughter. And then in August 14th, that week, starts the fall semester, and they've asked me to teach the book of Revelation. 22 chapters, and we're going to go verse by verse and teach them all of this. Of course, this is the book of Daniel, so not sure if we'll have time to cover that. But they're going to really learn Revelation. Because why? I want them to be God-fearing. I want them to be overcomers. Don't, 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 don't choose this path. And don't be deceived. Is Satan still around? Yes. Is the worldly system still around? Yes. Don't be conformed to the world, right? Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. Don't be conformed to the world. The world system. Don't think like it. How much TV do you watch? How much of these movies and commercials are you putting all this stuff in your head? Right? I mean, the few things that I watch, a little bit here there in sports, not as much anymore, because... The commercials, the promos, mm. the head of the household, right? The man? Mm. Oh, he's an idiot, yes. right? Everything you watch, he, he's the clown, right? Even the dog makes fun of the, of, the, of the man of the house, right? Who's the spiritual leader of the family? The man. The, head. the kids. I understand what you say. Jesus Christ is the spiritual oh, leader. I thought you meant the media world. Yeah, <laughs> The man is the head of the household, but the spiritual leader. Because the head of the house may want to go over here, right? And live horizontally in the worldly system. Okay? But your spiritual leader, yes, the man can be the head of the family, but, but your spiritual leader is still Jesus Christ. I mean, if he doesn't want to be an overcomer, do you follow him? No, you don't have to. You get to choose. You get to choose. No, I, I, I want to be an overcomer. I want to be at that wedding ceremony. Yes, I don't mind being at the feast, but I want to come to the feast as a bride, not as a friend. Questions? So what happens if you go as a friend? That means you missed the rapture. Good question. If you go as a friend, you're either an Old Testament saint, which you're not, because we're living in the new age, the, the, uh, the age of uh, grace, the New Testament time. And uh, so that means you have to come via the tribulation under the altar, the tribulation saints, for us. If you're a believer, then basically you're either going to be an overcomer or you're going to be a tribulation saint. That's correct. Or you come all the way through alive. You better have been helping the Jews. She, you don't want to end up over here. You don't want to end up over here and end up being a goat. I mean, can you imagine surviving all this and knowing about Jesus and, and, and you end up on the left as a goat? Well, what was the purpose in you surviving? 
If you find out yourself here, and you find out you're not a, under the altar, you haven't been beheaded, and you've been, and you've been able to survive and escape every way the Antichrist is trying to find you and hunt you down, you better be helping the Jews. Then you enter into the Messianic Kingdom. Then you don't die. Good question. Any other questions? Remind me, you said the Bema seat is for rewards and crowns. That's correct. Is that for the overcomers? Yes, correct. Okay. The bride. Right. It's for the bride, the overcomers. Can you imagine if you've been doing all you can for the Lord and, and you're expecting some crowns and, and some rewards and then all of a sudden you miss the rapture? Yeah, <laughs> you, you don't get your crowns and your rewards. You might still make it over here as a tribulation saint. Good question. Any other questions? It's just that um, where it says, even the elect, if possible, be deceived. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because at this point, the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to be given tremendous powers to deceive. Mm -hmm. It is not going to be easy here to be saved. And where it says in the Bible about pray that your flight not in a winter? He's talking to the Jews. You know, when the abomination and desolation flee. Tribulation. You know, pray that you're not pregnant, carrying a child. Or not, because we don't know if it's going to be, and pray that it's not in winter, the rainy season. You, you're trying to flee for your life. If you're trying to run in mud, you know, hope that the ground is dry. It's desert down there. You know, you're down near the Dead Sea. You're below 1,260 feet below sea level. But also the word, the word winter, is translated as meaning tribulation itself. No, but in this case, it just means now you're fleeing. You're trying to get over to southern Jordan, which is about 100 miles. And I don't know if you're going to be able to use any vehicles, but I don't know the situation when the Antichrist gets all the armies in the world to go against these Jews. You know, and I don't know what drones or what's going to be in the air trying to stop you. Okay. That's how come it says, when you see this, you, you better be moving. Don't be going down for anything because you're not going to get out of Jerusalem. Well, Heavenly Father, we love you so much. And we're so thankful that you love us so much that you gave us your word. That is who you are. That is how you think. And you gave it to us so that we may eat your word. So we may become in the image of your son, Jesus. So our minds... So our minds will be renewed. So we'll think like you do. So that our lives are transformed. So we won't be like this world, Lord. So that we will become overcomers. And I pray, Lord, that each and everybody here, that you'll give them uh, strength and courage to become overcomers. To read Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. And read the seven letters to the churches to find out where do they fit in. What must they overcome to truly be overcomers? And we're so thankful, Father, that you, that you sent your son, Jesus, down 65 years later to have John write to the seven churches and to show him what's ahead. And so we thank you, Father, that you have given us a way to be with you for all eternity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.